it feels weird being in here. I mean, it's cool that I'm out of my bathtub, but I don't know. It's like I'm starting the channel all over again. It's like a new room and a new setup, and that's just strange. And I guess you can't really tell because I'm just awkward every day, so it all works out. Now, we are doing an FAQ today, but before I talk about the FAQ, hello, I'm Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. Sudzers, welcome back to Soap and Clay. You are here for another round of 365 days of soap, and today we are doing an FAQ. It is day 99, which means we are one day away from 100, which is cool. I can't believe we lasted this long. And yeah, so I've sort of spaced out the FAQs every 33 days, essentially. We're doing another one, and today is no exception. Now, I really like putting in the FAQs because there are always lots and lots of questions that I am asked, uh, both in classes, at the shop, but you know, online, and people sending me messages and all the things. And also, there's a lot of misconceptions in the soap making world, and a lot of sort of information that we just kind of parrot because we heard it here one time, so let's all say the same thing over and over again. And a lot of it's just like patently false. And whenever I have the opportunity to sort of correct some of that, I totally do it, both within the videos, like, you know, trying things that you're never supposed to do, but also within the FAQ. So today we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into saponification, cure time, CPOP, those sorts of things. I know we touched on those in the last FAQ, but I ended up with lots of questions as a result. And so we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about those to like help you in your soapy journey. And you know, if you're not a soaper, but you are interested in the process, stick around because you know, it's fun to know, to learn how things are made and what the chemistry is behind the soapy things that you love using. So let's go check that out. Okay, so first up with this, what is saponification? Now, we talked about saponification in the last FAQ. Kind of gave you, you know, examples of what, you know, happens within a soap, right? So you have your fatty acids, you have your oils and your butters, and then you insert your, your caustic, your, your, your lye solution. And what is occurring within that is that you have the, uh, the caustic is breaking down the fatty acid, you know, chains and creating a new structure chemically, which is, uh, chemically speaking, a salt. And that is all occurring in the early stages of soap making, right? So you have the, uh, you know, you put your oils and you get your light water in there and you do your mixy mix with your little sick blender or your whisk or what have you. And that is starting that saponification process. So what you're doing at that point is you are forcing those fatty acid chains to break down, helping out with the uh, the breakdown you know using a mechanical you know method the, the stick blender really or just you know your, your whisk and that's where it begins and that's why you know soap batter starts to get thicker and do the thing because new uh, bonds are forming throughout this and we have you know we have the negative bonds negatively charged you know uh, structures and you have positively charged structures and it's creating sort of a honeycomb within uh, well within what becomes a solid soap or liquid soap if you're using potassium hydroxide, but that's, you know, a different story. And that process, the saponification process, it is complete within one to two days of making your soap, right? So 
within one to two days of putting your lye solution into your oils and doing the mixy mix thing, assuming that your measurements are right and your recipe is accurate and you have enough uh, lye to saponify the oils with whatever super fat you may or may not want in your recipe, that process is complete within one to two days, which means that soap is 100% safe to use within one to two days. So that's a huge misconception within the, the soaping world in that there are so many soapers that are really misinformed. I think they, uh, they, they, they heard something, they read something on the interwebs or something at some point that said, hey, this is not, your, your soap isn't safe to use for four weeks. And that's just, it's, it's chemically untrue. There is after that saponification process is you know, completed within that one to two day period, your soap is completely safe to use. It is not going to be you know, a danger to your skin or to you know, your hair if you're making a shampoo bar or anything. After that saponification process is complete, which is again, just the caustic working with the fatty acids and forming a new structure, which again, takes one to two days, your soap is safe and good to go. And that is something that I think uh, more soapers really need to remember that this is a chemical process and the, you know, that, that four week cure time is not the same thing as saponification. That is not what we are talking about when we are talking about saponification. We are talking about the actual conversion of your fatty acids and your lye solution, your caustic, into a new, you know, salt compound. And again, one to two days, within one to two days, your soap is safe to use. And that's hot process, cold process, that's, that's all of it. Okay, so then we follow that up with, you know, we have saponification, then what is cure? Like, why do we wait, you know, four to six weeks? Or, you know, some soap makers report <laughs> waiting a year before using their soap. So what is this cure time? What is that going to do? And that is a good question and a question that um, is asked pretty frequently and always has the same stock standard answer, which I guess bothers me um, from, a, from a science vein because the, st the stock standard answer is always, oh, four to six weeks and, you know, at least six months if you're making a soap that's heavy in olive oil and that's, that's bollocks. That, that's not, that's not accurate. The, the real reason for cure, right? For, so for cure, the whole point of cure is to really harden the bar. So that's going to be the number one thing because when you cut your soaps, your fresh soaps, they are very soft and the longer you let them sit with air, they the, the harder they get and that therefore the longer they last. And also one of the other reasons you uh, want to cure your soaps is to really allow the lather to come into its own because a fresh soap is going to yield not necessarily a different lather. I mean, it is different in that you have, a, again, a softer soap that you're working with and so the lather is not as big as it's going to be later, but it, it, again, the cure does help out with the lather. And also the, the crystalline structure within soaps is also an important part of cure. And you do want to allow your soaps time to, you know, form that structure, which again leads to a longer lasting bar. But there are a lot of factors at play with that. Like there were, uh, like the, the solid dish soap that I make, for example, that cures within a few days. It will not lose any more water weight. It will not form a bigger bubble. It will, the, the crystalline structure is already formed within just a few days. And so that particular soap does not benefit from a longer cure. And also, you know, since I make clay soaps, the clay actually really helps out with uh, forming that structure faster. And so it's also, you know, not necessary to cure for that full four to six weeks, but really it all does come down to the type of soap you're making 
what oils and butters you're you're using and you know what your recipe is if your recipe is really dialed in and you have you know extra extra bits in there that are helping out to speed up that cure time you do not have to wait the four to six weeks in order to to use the bars basically you want to wait until they are you know they stop losing water weight is going to be a good you know example of when it is ready to go and I know we talked about this in the last FAQ too but I really did want to give more information on that because I got a ton of questions for that and have seen continued to see a lot of really bad misinformation out there on you know soap boards regarding this okay so what is CPOP? CPOP is a very interesting thing it is a cold process oven process and I personally love CPOPing all of my soaps so what that means is I make the majority of my soaps cold process right and so you're, you're doing the things with your fatty acids and your, your lye and you know whatever and that is not done in a crock pot so that would be a hot process method if it was and then after my soaps have been poured into their molds I put a heat element to them so I actually keep my soaps at temperature of 180 degrees for several hours after the after the pour and that is you know sea popping now the benefits of sea popping is going they're going to be you're going to be able to unmold your soap faster you're going to ensure that your soaps go through gel which really helps the big bright colors like you know with this soap right here it's definitely sea popped because you want that that big beautiful pink to you know stay big and beautiful and pink and it also um, speeds up that spawnification process and you know makes your bar you know safer faster and for that reason I love sea popping my soaps and it's become a just a force of habit for me at this point it's like you can go either way sea popping is not necessary but I do like being able to cut my bars within you know 12 to 18 hours I do like being able to uh, get that spawnification process sped up as quickly as I can and I do want to ensure that all of the beautiful you know colors and everything retain their vibrance now there would be reasons why you would not see pop soap and that would be primarily soaps with uh, a lot of sugars in them if you had a lot of sugars or if you had a lot of hard oils you would probably not want to see pop those because they will form they, they have the potential to uh, form the cracks from the overheating in the middle of the bar as well as uh, glycerin rivers but I also love glycerin rivers so I happen to I, I look for those pretty often I actively try to get them so those would be reasons to not uh, see pop your soaps because you don't want them to overheat you don't want them to form glycerin rivers you don't you know and those those are the things but those are all things that I really love in the soap making process so I actively you know pursue them and that is just my style you do def you definitely do not have to see pop things you can just let them sit on the counter overnight but that's not how I do things so glycerin rivers are this is something that's talked about a lot and it's not I don't I don't think it's really fully understood as far as you know what they they actually are like where do they come from how do they you know form what are they are they are they bad for you that's always the, the biggest question with all soapy mishaps like is this dangerous and like 90% of the time the answer that is no it's always going to be it, most of the time it's going to be a cosmetic you know thing that you're going to be coming across like you know the the, the weird crackling on top of your soaps or the you know splits down the middle of your bars because there's too much heat and had to escape or you know glycerin rivers it, it, this is all cosmetic so glycerin rivers how what are they so in soap when you're making soap a natural byproduct of the saponification process right is glycerin and I'm sure you've heard of glycerin right glycerin is a humectant it is awesome it is used in lots and lots of high-end uh, skincare products and for people who make uh, soap on a big scale commercial level 
there are there's a secondary process where you can actually remove the glycerin from the bar and then that is sold um, in those are, that's put in high-end you know face care products and stuff like that so you're paying you know a mint for it but glycerin occurs naturally within all arts and bars of soap that is just part of the making of the soap and it, again a byproduct of saponification and normally glycerin is dispersed evenly throughout the entirety of the bar but every once in a while you will come across a bar that has you know things that look like you know rivers running throughout it and that is a concentration of the glycerin so instead of it dispersing evenly throughout the bar it ended up in these little like veins throughout you know the soap bar and I personally love glycerin rivers and so there are times when I actively try to get glycerin rivers because I think they're pretty cool and they can add to a design not to all designs right like this bar here that I'm, I'm stamping I wouldn't really want glycerin rivers in this because there's enough going on with this pattern as it is so I would try to avoid them now the way that you can avoid them is to the, the way the best way that I found to get or avoid glycerin rivers is to mess with your water content because remember water is arbitrary in soap making the amount of water that you use is not really uh, a set thing and actually these bars right here are a good example of glycerin rivers the stuff on the top above the heart you see the kind of veiny you know stuff going on those are some light glycerin rivers and I was playing with that with this particular you know bar but the best way to ensure that you don't get glycerin rivers is to reduce your water in your recipe and so you know conversely the best way to get glycerin rivers is to put more water in really and that's been the only tried and true way that I have found to avoid or ensure glycerin rivers is by either increasing your water content by quite a bit or decreasing it by you know not quite a bit but you know you can you can reduce it and also pay attention to bars that have like beers and sugars and stuff in them because you're more likely to get glycerin rivers with those as well so if you don't want them definitely reduce water content and that is gonna do it for today's FAQ now as always if you have any questions through your soapy journey or you've seen something on the channel that you're curious about or you're not a soap maker but you just want to lo you know learn more about this all of those things are you know completely welcome here and I enjoy at you know when people ask questions I enjoy answering the questions and it really gives me an opportunity to really do more deep dives into the science behind things because that's ultimately where my brain exists with all this anyway and so if you ask me a question I get to geek out for a while and that makes me super happy so yeah if you have any questions on you know anything just you know, hit me up I you can DM me I am I'm easy to find I, I'm all there doing the things but for now for today's FAQ that is going to do it it is day 99 we have almost made it a full 100 days which is awesome and I really appreciate you being around for all of it thank you and that wraps it up for today's FAQ. It is day 99, which is amazing. I cannot believe we've lasted 99 days. That feels big and awesome. And I appreciate every single one of you that have been along for this whole ride. Or, you know, if you've just joined us recently, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's 99 days in a row of soapy content, which is kind of blowing my mind. But yeah, so that was the FAQ for day 99. And if you have any questions, obviously, you know, hit me up in DMs or call me or find me, ask me questions in the show, whatever. And your questions might very well end up on an FAQ, you know, in the future. And you know, that kind of does it for, for me today. And again, I really appreciate you sticking around for another round of 365 days of soap. And tomorrow is day 100, which is cool. So if you haven't subscribed, subscribe and you can celebrate day 100 along with us because it's really cool that we've, uh, we've made it this far with daily content. And yeah, that basically does it for me today and I will see all of you tomorrow.